First of all, we have the leader, who is charismatic and usually a narcissist. The first girl I ever hooked up with was at my party at my cottage. That girl is the girl he's marrying. Cult leaders are power-hungry individuals who are typically narcissists who believe that the world revolves around them. The staff man showed him the way. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah, The cult will be playing on fear, love, grief, whatever your emotions are, to get you to comply and perform. Well, you're a girl. It's a lot easier for you to be a virgin, because the longer you stay a virgin, the more pure and innocent you seem. The longer I stay a virgin, the more I become the laughing stock of the entire school. I told you I'm not ready. Can I be ready enough for the both of us? Hello everybody, it's me, Pinely. I'm talking to you right now from a classic, sunny, um, American college campus slash high school. Uh, you can tell from the, the visuals that go out of my window and all these books. Look at all these goddamn books. The American Pie Cinematic Universe is absolutely bonkers. I was recently reminded of the fact that these uh, uh, love-making filled movies, I'm gonna have to call it that to avoid demonetization, were a, a pretty big part of my teenage years. I remember absolutely adoring them. One time when I was like 15, I remember watching almost all of them on a 15 hour flight to New York, and I, I'm pretty sure I had a pretty good time. Uh, the, the nudity probably helped quite a bit. In general, I feel like if you're somewhere between my age, which is 22, I'm a young man, to like 35, there's a pretty good chance that you've watched one of these movies in your formative teenage years. A very special age where what you know about the world of lovemaking, adult lovemaking time, is sometimes just limited to, you know, things that you see on TV and movies, or lies that your friends might tell you. And back then, I vividly remember that whenever I watch one of these movies, and a joke or statement might come up about a topic that I didn't really know anything about at the time. Like, I don't know, women or women. I'd be like, haha. But but is this actually true though? Can can someone tell me, please? Uh, I really I really need to know. So recently, I got a bit intrigued. I decided to look it up, mm. and I realized that this series has more installments than all the Spider-Man movies combined. There are nine American Pie movies out there. Th that's kind of nuts. How did that even happen? The, the first American Pie movie is literally just about a group of teenage boys looking to get laid before they finish high school. How did anyone manage to, to squeeze nine movies out of that concept? Did they do it in a Fast and Furious style where things just get more and more insane with every installment? Do they hook up with aliens in the latest American Pie movie that came out, believe it or not, in 2020? Well, I, uh, being the genius that I am, decided to watch all nine of these American Pie movies in the span of four days while I was sick in bed with uh, stupid Omicron. And while I can tell you for a fact there are no aliens involved in this series at all, I can, however, tell you that, that there are some really suspicious things going on in this series. Some very odd and suspicious activities regarding the kind of messages that they deliver about just women as a whole. And the cult-like tactics that are used to make our characters believe in these awful, awful things. And not only the characters, but us the viewers at home. Because if you watch American Pie movie number 9 and that movie alone, you might mistakenly think that this is a fairly woke series after all. Just don't throw up anywhere or do any non-consensual groping. That's your job for today. I believe in you. Seeing this comment about how American Pie is actually not a fan of groping women without their consent it's kind of shocking. It gives off the same vibe as seeing your childhood bully post a post on Instagram about how they're a big fan of pacifism. At that point, of seeing American Pie 9, I have went through something around 30 non-consensual gropings. Coffee for the pretty lady? Sure. Thanks. Let me know if you want some creamer with that. <laughs> you had that happen in almost every single movie up until this point, and almost every single time, it was played out for jokes. Okay, big question. Why are there nine American Pie movies? Well, make a shit ton of money. Simple as that. They're like that kind of 
geese that poop gold. First movie, arguably, but not really, the best one, cost them something around 11 million dollars, made them 235 million. Jesus Christ. Second movie cost them uh, 30 million dollars, made them almost 290 million. Accounted for inflation, that's like almost half a billy right there. Half a billy. So, it would only make sense that after three movies with a main cast, they would have to move on and do a spin-off series straight to DVD. And they decided to call it American Pie Presents. Um, most of them are pretty bad. They're very, very trashy, in my opinion. I have a theory that I'm pretty confident about, that these American Pie Presents movies are essentially created as a way to trick people going into video stores in the 2000s into thinking that they're buying or renting out a real American Pie movie with a main cast and everything. And yeah, ju just look at this DVD cover and tell me that I'm wrong. I recently went through an eye exam and the optometrist was really, really impressed with my eyeballs. She said, wow. I've never seen eyeballs like this in my whole life. You see great. <sighs> but I'm pretty sure I was lied to now because for the life of me, it, I, I could not see that presents for the first few time I looked at this poster. It's so tiny. You need to bust out a magnifying glass just to look at this thing. Oh, by the way, I should quickly mention that this video is sponsored by Manscaped, which is pretty good because this video took me like two years to make. So thank you, Manscaped, for putting food on my table this month. It's a new year, everybody. It's 2022. Why not treat yourself a little, huh? There's a lot for you out there to treat yourself with on Manscaped.com, including the Performance Package 4.0. I even have it here with me in the flesh. My personal favorite product in this kit is the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. This is great for beard maintenance, which, I mean, I I have I sort of have a beard, so bit of an expert about that one. This trimmer is designed specifically with advanced skin safe technology, which helps reduce cuts on the most sensitive areas of your body. This thing is cordless and waterproof, so you can take that bad boy right there with you into the shower. Super convenient and makes for a very easy cleanup too. So what exactly are you waiting for? Start the new year off right and head off straight to manscaped.com. You'll get a 20% discount, free international shipping, and two free gifts when you use code PINELY at checkout. So in this video, I want to be doing a few things. I want to open up these silly movies that were clearly just made for the sake of their raunchiness and analyze the hell out of them. This series was so unbelievably influential at the time that it came out, so you can't help but ask, what kind of lessons does it try to teach? What are the main messages that we get from the American Pie universe? Do these movies present women as competent human beings or as robots that are there to just please every urge that a man would have. It definitely changes from film to film, I'll tell you that much. And most importantly, I want to talk about all this cult stuff that these movies have going on in them. Uh, but for now, I, I just want to mention that some American Pie movies are definitely better than others. This film, compared to the others, feels quite earnest. It tries to be a pretty extreme depiction of the awkwardness of high school life, and I'd say that for the most part, they definitely managed to do that. This story here is about a group of guys in high school who make a pact to lose their virginity before the year ends. This is essentially all that they care about in life. This is just their only, their only thing. <laughs> they, I don't think they have any aspirations or any goals other than that. I don't think they even go to class, like, ever. They're just kind of walking around in hallways, talking to each other, but not ever actually going into a classroom. Let's go through some of our characters. Our main one in this movie is Jim Levenstein, played by Jason Biggs, who's a bit more of a dorky guy in this movie. He constantly gets into crazy, awkward shenanigans, and gets caught by his parents doing stuff to himself, later on leading to him having very awkward conversations with his dad. Um, talking about hormones and whatnot. There's Paul Finch, who's just like your classic Redditor who thinks they're really sophisticated and cool. Would you object if I said that you were quite striking? There's Oz, the jock with a heart of gold. There's Kevin, who is like... Actually, I don't really know how to describe Kevin. I, I don't really like him all that much. I don't think he has that much interesting of a personality. And then there is Stifler, who... I think should just should just drop dead. He is the worst man in the world throughout this series. 
He's constantly trying to manipulate and lie to women. He's constantly slapping the behind area of them without them agreeing to it. And he's also the future leader of the Stifler cult. So obviously make sure to remember him. He's a big player in this series. In this movie though, he really isn't one of the main characters. He's more of a guy that the other guys think is a bit disgusting and try to stay away from. Um, yeah, I mean, that's exactly the role I think he should have. Uh, keep him in the sidelines, as far as I care. The creamer with that. In the rest of the series, though, this does change. He manages to creep his way out of the shadows and eventually becomes a pretty main character. I guess the audience just reacted really positively to all of his uh, prank pulling and getting laid a lot and slapping non-consenting butts. Now, this sort of desperation that our characters are facing, this a need of theirs to make love to a woman before the year ends leads to them uh, being in some sort of situations that are not that great. Like tricking a girl into thinking you're sensitive or putting non-stop constant pressure on your girlfriend to sleep with you even though she constantly states that this isn't really something that she feels ready for. And even uh, making love to a pie. I was thinking about how uh, both my parents and my grandparents watch my videos. So that's pretty cool. But this is actually where the movie goes right afterwards because after all these things happen, at the end of this, the characters say out loud to Kevin, Listen man, just can you please, for a, just for a sheer moment, stop with this non-stop obsession with sex. We, we just want to enjoy prom. Us. Is this vocal jazz shit gonna pay off or what? Kevin, what's with the attitude? Attitude? This is the night we've been waiting for. We're in this together, you guys can't back out. Kevin, you don't need us to get laid. Are you afraid or something? We made a pact. You can't break that. I don't have to do shit. You know, forget it already. I, I, I am so sick and tired of all this bullshit pressure. I mean, I, I've never even had sex and already I can't stand it. I hate sex! I think that one of the best and more heartwarming things to happen in these movies is the character arc that um, Oz the Jock goes through. It is shockingly similar to the story of Troy and Gabrielle and High School Musical. It starts with Oz flirting with a college girl uh, using a bunch of awful cheesy pickup lines. He tells him, listen bucko, this, this sort of stuff is awful. No one likes this stuff. Girls are not going to be impressed by it. Girls like a man who's sensitive, a man who actually listens to them. Oz hearing that is like, huh, that seems pretty hard. Maybe I could just pretend that I'm sensitive. He decides that his best course of action is to join the choir, the, the choir, the choir. I got absolutely prosecuted for the way I said epitome in my last video. Listen, this is in my native language, all right? This, this is just another language for me. What you're seeing right now you, you gotta just be impressed by it. You gotta say in the comments, wow, Pinely, you are so cool that you speak English that way. Epidome. Fucking dumbass. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, he joins the choir because that's where all the hot girls are, according to this movie. You know what? As a singer, the second he opens his mouth, everyone's like, wow, this is incredible. But, but I don't think it is. Why, why would you think that that is good? Isn't that your job? So you've got this sort of Frank Sinatra thing going on there. Sinatra thing going on? <laughs> what are you talking about? You can't trick me into thinking that he's a good singer by saying that he's a good singer. I, I just I just heard him with my own ears. I know that he's not that great. Him and Heather eventually get into a bit of a relationship thanks to him pretending that he's sensitive. At first that seems very manipulative, but then you start thinking, hey, and maybe him faking opening up has actually led to him opening up for real. She catches him and his friends hyping him up for having managed to sneak his way into possibly getting to f her. She gets angry, rightfully so, and then uh, he tries to make it up for her because he actually loves her. Blah 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 blah. Uh, later on, there's a big lacrosse game going on. 
the big the big high school lacrosse game that everybody really cares about because they're at high school the coach is giving them a motivational speech he tells them listen everybody this is the pinnacle moment in your high school time this is exactly the kind of moment where you decide what kind of person you want to be in life and Oz hearing this decides that lacrosse can essentially go to hell he throws all of his lacrosse stuff on the floor he's like screw you lacrosse and he runs he runs like hell to the big choir show that he promised Heather he's gonna be at and everyone thinks he's great all of my days with a love so sweet in so many ways later on Oz even decides to be fully honest with Heather uh, telling her about the pact that him and his friends did, saying how silly he all realizes that it was. Which, funnily enough, leads to him actually sleeping with her and uh, getting what he wanted before he learned his lesson. So, wait a second. Uh, was this still all part of his plan? Was he still pretending to be a sensitive guy to the end? Is Oz just a, just a master manipulator? Probably not. But... Yeah, I mean, he got exactly what he wanted before he learned his lesson. In fact, all of his friends get to do that. They all tried to chase this thing like a bunch of crazed maniacs, and they got exactly that. Compared to the plot of a film like Superbad, which is quite similar, but way better in my opinion, at the end of it, Seth, who has this kind of insane master plan to try to um, get with the girl of his dreams by getting her drunk at a party. At the end of the movie, spoiler alert, skip to this timestamp if you don't want to get spoiled, he doesn't get to do that. Instead, he has a super cute sleepover with Michael Sarah, where he realizes the importance of their friendship. That's really, really sweet in my opinion, and definitely drives the point that they want to drive home. American Pie doesn't choose to do that, uh, but I guess the main point of these movies is just to show you people making love so um it is what it is other relationships in this movie that i liked a lot less than oz and heathers are kevin and vicky god kevin is the worst kind of dude ever the way kevin portrays vicky in this relationship is as this annoying gatekeeper who refuses to sleep with him unless he says that the magic word, which is love. She is like a troll guarding a sacred tower and saying the word love is just the secret code. I put in months of quality time with Vicky. Sherman meets a chick for one night and scores. This is just wrong. Wow, well, I put in months of quality time with my girlfriend so I can score with her. Oh, but she doesn't let me score, you guys. Ah, oh, shut the hell up, Kevin, you stupid idiot. Kevin, what's with the attitude? We also have Jim and Nadia. Nadia is an exchange student from Eastern Europe who stays at Jim's place to study with him. When Jim tells his friends about this, about the fact that she's going to be coming over to study for a little bit, they're like, whoa, bro, you're going to have a hot girl in your room? Man, she might take, take her clothes off. Oh, wow. Y you know what you should do? You know what you should do about this? You should place a secret webcam in your room to film her and broadcast it to all of us. And everyone thinks that it's a great idea. Everyone agrees with that. Everyone's like, yeah, no, yeah, you should do that. Fair enough. There's gonna be Eastern European chick naked in your house. You're not gonna do anything about that? What am I gonna do, huh? Broadcast her over the internet? You can do that? No, I cannot do that to her. Man, if you don't have the guts to photograph a naked chick in your house, how the hell are you ever gonna sleep with one? I don't like the kid, but he's got a point, Jim. That is insane. What? Eventually, this leads to Jim essentially um, embarrassing himself while the whole thing is broadcasted to the whole school by accident. And yeah, uh, that's kind of where the main focus is after that. Compared to other bad things that they did, this movie doesn't really treat this action as something that was bad morally, but more of just something that was bad because it was a bad idea. It was only bad because he ended up embarrassing himself on camera, not because of what he did to Nadia, which is kind of, that's kind of a bad message. This eventually leads to Jim being with Michelle, which we'll talk about afterwards. Uh, but Nadia, after that, got booted straight back to wherever she's from. And th th there's just no moment of consideration to, you know, how she feels about the situation. As far as we as an audience are led to believe, doing this to her was absolutely fine.
This time the gang are in college and they're meeting up for a summer vacation. I don't really want to talk about the entirety of this movie. A lot of it is just a rehash of American Pie 1, repeating lots of gags that happened before. And this time, I feel like the lessons aren't nearly as endearing as they were the first time. Really though, the main thing I wanted to focus on when it comes to this movie is one specific scene that, that I just found to be especially rancid. I want to see how American Pie 2 addresses the existence of lesbians. Because this scene stood out to me like a sore thumb. It, it was awful and just so unnecessary in this movie. I'd play it out to you, but my video would get demonetized because the scene is unbelievably adult. And also, my video would probably get taken down because Universal owns these movies and they are a bunch of greedy little assholes. So instead, let's go over these events bit by bit while only showing very short clips that are cropped in weird ways and, and just hope for the best. And uh, more importantly, let's try to unpack what is American Pie actually trying to say here in the longest running scene in the whole movie. Maybe the longest running scene in the whole 15 hour franchise. Two possible lesbians in their bras and panties. Lesbians? Uh, did you say lesbians? So the guys are painting houses as part of their summer jobs, while suddenly the two women who live in one of the houses they're painting go out of it for a bit of a stroll. Stifler in turn stares at them with these auga kind of eyes. Absolutely dumbfounded by what he just noticed. Two women holding hands. Guys, look, lesbians, he says in the same cadence as one would use when discovering a rare beast. Lesbians live here, he says. Lesbians live here. And if there was any confusion about Stifler's intent, we immediately cut to an ass shot of the two girls as they walk away. His thoughts are obviously, oh man, look, they're lesbians. They're definitely something for me to sexualize here. Oh, these girls are lesbians for my own enjoyment, for my own pleasure. And the movie sort of indicates at first that that is wrong by obviously having Stifler be the one to deliver these lines. He is still at this point the voice of all evil in these movies and his opinion shouldn't really be trusted. Finch even immediately calls him homophobic afterwards, not for sexualizing the girls, but for just assuming that they're gay. The movie is essentially telling us Hey, you know, we did bring up the notion that lesbians are something to be gawked at like animals in the zoo, but we are not taking part in any of this. Our literal worst guy is the person saying that. And if you think that we are part of this, ah, oh, get your head out of the gutter, you sick, sick bastard. But what they do about four minutes afterwards, um, essentially fully contradicts that. Right, now's my chance. I need confirmation. Stifler decides he's gonna break into these girls' house saying, I'm gonna need a confirmation. I need confirmation. Listen, pal, I'm gonna need a confirmation on these girls' lesbianism. Uh, stat. I'm gonna need it right now, right here, right now. He goes into their house through their window. He breaks into their home. And then uh, Jim and Finch go after him to, to get him the hell out of there. Stifler steals one of the girls' uh, toys and then swings it above his head like a literal child, uh, saying, listen guys, I just found a lesbian artifact. I'm looking for more lesbian artifacts. Who wrote this? Gotta, I gotta look this up. David H. Steinberg and Adam Hertz, according to IMDb. Okay, I'm gonna be remembering these names now. But then, uh-oh, the, the girls are coming back home, so they need to find a place to hide. They, they all hide in the under the bed or in the closet or whatever. In a very unsurprising way, the girls instantly take their clothes off the second they come into the room, and the guys can see everything. They're getting a private show from the lesbians. The girls eventually catch them hiding and are about to call the police, but instead, they come up with a, with a genius idea. They will play a game where they will do uh, something adult to each other, and in turn, the guys will do something adult to each other too. This scene goes on for what in my eyes seemed like years. It just lasts forever and ever. It's so slow and it's just so unbelievably awkward. There's barely any music going on compared to other scenes in the movie. The dialogue is quite slow 
and it's just like the plot of the movie comes to a complete halt just so this scene could exist. It's really bizarre. Skipping on forward in the movie, uh, Stifler at his party ends up hooking up with the two girls after they tell him that they're not just lesbians or, or something along these lines. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. Which at the end means that these girls weren't lesbians from the get-go. But I don't know, it just still gives off the vibe that same-sex relationships are something for you to sexualize or something for you to fetishize in a way. And... Uh, something for a guy to try to crack into. Brilliant. You found lesbians. Huh. Good luck trying to break through that force field. Lesbians? We never said that. Let's just take this all in for a moment and try to understand exactly what is this movie's intention here? What are they trying to say? Because it's really starting to feel like calling Stifler a homophobe earlier was mainly just a way for them to cover their own asses. I just sat through an unbelievably long scene where the creators of American Pie 2 are essentially telling me that these girls that are in a same-sex relationship are really nothing more than something for me to gawk at. That is the entire role that they serve in this movie. It's, it's just that. And these girls, oh, they, they love the fact that men are interested in their relationship. They even take their a radio device and broadcast the whole thing to everyone listening in the town. Them making the guys touch a man butt is again just another way for them to cover their asses. They're saying with this, oh no, this this is fine, what we're doing is fine because we're mirroring the situation to the other gender. Please, leave us alone. The scene is really really hard to get through, not only because of the moral problem with it, but also just because it has no place in the movie whatsoever. Does it help move the plot forward in any way, shape, or form? Nope. Besides Stifler managing to crack his way into the lesbian safe afterwards, there's actually barely any reference to these events happening. It doesn't lead to any sort of domino effect that affects the, the final outcome of the movie. It would have been unbelievably easy to cut it out in the editing room. I've even checked, and it's about 15 minutes long in total. You know what 15 minutes is? 15 minutes is the difference in runtime between American Pie 1 and 2. So you could have just easily plucked this bad boy out of there and life would have been fine. A few things I liked about this movie, there's a bit where Jason Biggs runs and hits his head on a big bell. Hey! What are you doing? Ow! I gotta admit, uh, I laughed out loud from that because I'm a... <laughs> I'm a, I'm a big dumb oaf. Him and Michelle end up being together in an actual relationship at the end of this movie which is kind of nice, I like both of them. I also really like the summer vibe that this movie has going on. And uh, the music choices that I can't play are pretty impeccable. Things I didn't really like is uh, Stifler. I kept writing in my notes about how I wish he was dead. I just, I, I can't stand seeing him all the time. He's so annoying. But little did I know that he was actually going to be the, the main character of the next film. Michelle, Jim, and Jim's dad are my favorite characters in the American Pie cinematic universe. And because of that, I kind of would have loved a movie that focuses on the three of them and uh, Jim's and Michelle's adventures while they're getting into marriage. This concept had the potential of maybe being my favorite out of the bunch. But instead, some sadistic asshole decided to turn this movie into a, a Stifler movie instead. How did he do it? He managed to get up the ranks and slowly move on from being a silly side character to the main, the, the main guy in the movie. This movie is definitely about him. This film is just pure unfiltered ass. The cinematography is really, really odd. The kind of colorful visuals that we got in the last few films are switched to this. It's filmed like a, an ad for back pain medication. It really sets a weird tone throughout the whole film because on one hand we get characters spewing poop and pee pee jokes left and right. But on the other hand, it's filmed like this. I think the only way for me to get any sort of enjoyment or value out of this piece of bad art is if I decide to look at this movie strictly as a tragedy. A movie that encapsulates the tragic and pathetic life of Steve Stifler. Towards the beginning of this film, we get a subtle reminder of Stifler's flaws as a human being, as he performs um, 
mouth lovemaking on a dog and also seems to be vividly enjoying it. Is it weird that it feels good? What else? Oh yeah, he tries to trick a girl into thinking that he's this innocent do-gooder so he can steal her virginity all to himself. He puts himself and his own needs above anyone else in his life and he talks like a complete bozo. No pussy, no dancing, okay? No pussy, no dancing. His existence is sad and pathetic and the way that he treats women is more or less the only thing that leads him on his life. He very much cares about what people around him think about him, unless they think that he's a complete asshole. But now all of this has finally come together and comes back to bite Stifler in the ass. When he realizes that he hasn't been invited to Jim's wedding, Jim, one of his closest and probably only friends in the whole world, hasn't invited him to his wedding. But instead of being angry or upset about it, it seems like Stifler is somewhat aware of the fact that he's the worst, and instead just kind of tries to beg Jim to invite him to his wedding. For his own self-image, he desperately needs to hold on to this facade of a friendship and decides to offer Jim to give him free dancing lessons in turn of him inviting him to his wedding, stating that this is essentially the only thing that he's good at. As the movie goes, people get more and more sick of him, he keeps acting like a dumb child all the time, and the true peak of that reaches when he accidentally kills all the flowers for Jim and Michelle's wedding a day before the actual event, uh, while waiting there for a girl to have sex with him. The usually sympathetic Jim decides that he has had enough, this was the final straw. Stifler's awful choices, him putting his own desires over his closest friends, finally came back and destroyed him. And Jim decides to cut him out of his life. And you know what? That's fine by me. End the movie there. That's that's a happy ending in my opinion. I've seen this guy slam so many non-consensual butts. I've seen him just be awful all the time. What, what am I supposed to do? Feel bad about him? I'm not gonna feel bad about him. Maybe you should just leave, Stifler. Fine. Adios. But obviously, my happiness only lasts for about five minutes, because immediately afterwards, Stifler decides to change his ways. He becomes a new man, he miraculously manages to, to find a way to get the, the flowers in there, he, he just changes everything for the better, and now everyone loves him. Man. He even decides to settle down, falling in love with Michelle's sister, and from here on out, he's about to lead a life based on honesty and truth. Just kidding. Uh, next movie is in, American Reunion. He's just back to being the same kind of guy he was before. They, they just like threw that whole character arc away to the trash. So this whole journey, this whole movie, was just was just straight up for nothing. It it served absolutely no purpose in the grand scheme of things. So that's pretty cool. At this point, I've become so immersed, so engulfed in the American Pie cinematic universe that I was able to to predict every single move that these characters would make. The second this ring was shown and Michelle's mom was like, yeah, you know this ring, this beautiful, beautiful ring, it was passed down in generations from my grandma. It means so much to me, this ring. Ah, oh, I love it so much. I knew right there and then that something absolutely disgusting was gonna happen to that ring. Lo and behold, later on, a dog eats that ring, poops it out, and then Stifler ends up eating the poop with the ring pretending that it's chocolate. You know why they do that? Because these movies just can't let anything beautiful exist in peace. Every beautiful ring needs to be covered in shit. So after tying up all their main trilogy with the wedding and all that kind of stuff, the American Pie cast decided to go their separate way and live their own life. But wanting to squeeze more money out of this extremely lucrative property, Universal decided to create this trashy spin-off series. These films are somehow raunchier than the originals, uh, becoming pretty close at times to something that you might find on the hub, uh, acting-wise as well. The acting in these is just, just, just dog shit. I was a virgin until last year, and then my girlfriend dumped me about four months ago. Wait, wait, wait. 
Are you telling me that you haven't... in four months? I think they just realized that they could get away without having any plot in these movies. No one actually cares about that. In the movie American Pie Presents Naked Mile, I swear to God, I barely remember what happens in that film. I think people run and they're naked for a mile, but besides that, it all just kind of washed over me. It's about a guy who's Stifler's cousin, and he gets a pass from his girlfriend to sleep around with other girls because she wants them to have a special moment, and she's holding out for him saying the word love or some shit like that. Let's get real. He's a guy, and guys have certain needs. They really do. It's like a caveman thing or something. Yeah, you know, it's true that you're in high school, and maybe you don't feel ready to do this sort of thing yet, but hey, guys are like cavemen. No, nothing you can do about it. You gotta succumb to their needs. Big reminder, this movie was only written by a group of dudes. An actual real-life woman uh, would probably not write this line. The plot point of a girl holding out sex from a guy who can't possibly control his needs and is like a caveman repeats itself so many times in these movies. It's kind of crazy. These scripts are almost copy-pasted at times. And are they actually connected to the main series? Well, yes. Actually, surprisingly, they actually cared to do that. Eugene Levy, who plays Jim's dad, shows up in all of them except of the 2020 movie. Uh, I guess he just he just had enough at this point. I'm not sure who he owns money to, but man, every time he shows up with these beautiful eyebrows of his, he, he was like a ray of sunshine in my life. I'd also consider myself part of the strong eyebrow gang, so it's pretty nice getting this kind of representation in the best movies of all time. But the main thing to attach all of these movies has to be the Stifler family. Or shall I say, the Stifler cult. It's almost as if there's some kind of divine entity up there that despises me because there's one of those pieces of shit in every single American Pie movie, uh, presents or not. After American Wedding, I figured, hey, that's it. If I ever encounter this man again, it's gonna be this new, improved, changed version of him. I don't need to sit through him being an annoying little child anymore. But with this, they can just have a guy be the new Stifler every single time because it is literally a different person. They always need someone to fill that role for some reason because, I don't know, I guess that's the character that everybody loves the most. People really, really idolize this guy. That's not a great person to idolize. I went through the reviews of American Wedding and all of them are about how cool and funny Stifler is. The Stifler was literally the legendary character ever. The guy's laugh and the jokes were amazing as hell. He was great entertainer. I think I kind of recognize this writing style. I think this I think this might come from uh, Anthony Fantano's uh, Burner account. So yeah, we got to see a representative of the Stifler family in every single one of these movies. Let's go over the family tree together. Some bits of it are not too clear because th there are lots of cousins involved and I'm not sure if some of the cousins are siblings or not, but we'll, we'll see, we'll see as we go. I actually wrote down all these details like a complete idiot while watching the movies only to realize that someone has already done it and made a whole uh, wiki page about the Stifler family. The Stifler family plays a central role in the American Pie movies. While not always the main characters, the family always plays a major role and is featured in all movies. The most notable Stifler is Steve, of course, of course, of course, who plays both the antagonist turn hero in the four canon films. While Steve is perhaps the most popular and beloved, his brother Matt, cousins Dwight, Eric, and Scott have played roles in the spin-off films. Oh, okay, this is a bit of an outdated article. Uh, they're missing the newest member of the family, Stephanie Stifler. Okay, so we have Steve Stifler, the main one, his mom, Janine Stifler. I don't think we know his dad's name, but we'll put that on the family tree either way. Then we got Matt, his younger brother, who shows up as a kid in the original canon films, but we see him later again as a teenager in American Pie Presents Band Camp. That comes up right after the American Wedding, chronologically. Compared to his brother, who his main motivation is just to please himself, it seems like Matt copies his bigger brother's actions, just because he wants him to like him. Okay, then in American Pie Presents the Naked Mile, 
Uh, we have Eric Stifler, who's Steve Stifler's cousin. He isn't actually a full-on uh, narcissist, sex crazed maniac, so no one actually even refers to him as Stifler. Uh, but I, I guess he should take that as a compliment. We also have his dad, Steven's uncle, on his father's side, who actually is all those things that I said earlier. When I was your age, I was up to my neck in poop tank. I didn't have time to spank my monkey. Stiflers do not fake being sick to stay home and pull dick. We cut class to get ass. In the same movie, we got Dwight Stifler, who's Eric's cousin. He also gets laid a lot, but he's not as annoying as Steve or Matt Stifler because it seems like he actually holds some sort of compassion to people at times. Now, not always, but sometimes. We got Scott Stifler, who's actually somewhat of a villainish type of character. Uh-oh. In uh, American Pie Book of Love. And lastly, Stephanie Stifler who I, I don't even know how she's related to anyone, but I think they just don't really care at this point. She's more of a badass, that's kind of her character, and less of a harasser. This article is pretty great. Uh, the Stifler boys are often victims of embarrassing and disgusting things happening to them. Steve drank a filled beer in American Pie 1. Steve got pissed on when he thought he was getting champagne poured on him. Steve eats dog shit. Uh, what else? Matt drinks spit lace soda. Eric poops in a dryer. Well, what a family, huh? At some point when watching all these movies, I've developed a theory that the Stiflers aren't even a family at all, but rather a cult. Except of Matt and Steve Stifler, none of these people even look the same. That they don't look related in any sort of way, shape, or form. Also, how many goddamn cousins can Steve Stifler have on his dad's side that are also born to male fathers. Things are just not really adding up. That's all I'm saying. So with the help of Dr. Yanya Lalich, a sociologist who uh, studies and writes about cults, let's go over together some of the cult-like features that the Stifler family has. First of all, we have the leader who is charismatic and usually a narcissist. We don't really know who's the main leader of the Stifler cult, but let's just imagine that every kind of American Pie crew with its own Stifler is sort of like a splinter group, its own mini cult. With the appointed Stifler, the leader, trying to get more people to join him. If that's the case, these guys and one girl ooze of charisma and narcissism. They get people to do whatever they want to just satisfy what they want at the end of the day. In the first movie, Steve Stifler was the main guy to push Jim to film Nadia without her consent. And in that moment, he managed to get all the guys to agree with him, to be on his side. In American Pie Presents Beta House, the worst one of them by the way, uh, Dwight Stifler ends up joining a sex addict support group with the sole purpose of trying to find a woman for himself, trying to get some girls for himself. And he manages to do just that using his charisma and charm. He abuses a woman's addiction for his own pleasure, and the film makes him look like a badass for it. I have been sex free for two years now. Second, we have what I call the transcendent belief system that gives you the answer to everything. The belief system here is mainly that you should be sleeping with lots of people all the time. And you know, if you want to be doing that, have your fun, nothing wrong with that. The main problem comes when you realize that these people would do literally anything to achieve that goal. Using the most manipulative, cunning, and just straight up immoral tactics. It seems like this is the only goal that the Stifflers have in life. This is like the only thing that they're really proud of in any sort of way. This is the list. All the chicks I ever banged. You serious? Is that two-sided? It is. It nice. Is. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good goal for you to try to keep up with your old man. The senior Stifler shows his son the list of all the people he scored, as if it's like a, a scavenger hunt or something like that. Tells him, here, dear son, this is a good goal for you to keep up with. If you do this, I shall be proud of you. You see this in almost all of these movies. In Bandcamp, for example, when Matt Stifler, Steve's brother, is sent to the Bandcamp after doing some, some trouble up in his school. He's very sad, he's bummed out. But he takes solace in the fact that he heard some rumors that 
Th these band girls are really freaky and are up to some some kind of nasty freaky shit. And he sees this as the one thing that will solve all of the problems that he's currently facing in life. This will bring him salvation. The systems of influence, the cult will be playing on fear, love, grief, you know, whatever your emotions are to get you to comply and conform. I want us to take a look at this scene of Eric Stifler explaining to his girlfriend why she should, in fact, have love-making adult time with them, even though she doesn't really want to. I told you I'm not ready. Can I be ready enough for the both of us? Can't I just be ready for the both of us? Oh, you're not ready to do this thing? Well, why can't my readiness just be enough for us both? That seems fine by me. It's fine if I like to do this and you don't. Yeah. She tells him that it doesn't really work that way, and he in return replies with, he sounds like a child who's been denied ice cream by his parents. I know how patient you've been. I know, it's just sometimes, well, you're a girl. It's a lot easier for you to be a virgin, because the longer you stay a virgin, the more pure and innocent you seem. The longer I stay a virgin, the more I become the laughing stock of the entire school. Ignoring the awful sentiment of this whole scene for just a second, let's just, just take that, curl that into a ball, and put that aside for just a moment. Here, we get to actually see it. We get to see a character express the fear that the Stiflers abuse and prey upon to get people to join their way of life. Eric has been so deeply impacted by the thought that the people around him might expect him not to be a virgin anymore, that he is essentially pushing the same kind of pressure onto his girlfriend. When telling her why he thinks they should do it, her wanting to do it or not, is barely like a factor here. There, there's barely any importance to that. His main motive here is just to get rid of this fear, this judgment, the potential that he might be the laughing stock of his school. At the end of the Naked Mile, Eric comes back from university riding a horse to tell his girlfriend how much he actually loves her, and that scoring isn't the most important thing in the world, which in true American Pie fashion obviously leads to him actually getting to do that. At this point, I realize that this is just a shtick that they do. You know, they they let you watch all this morally bankrupt stuff. And at the end of the movie, they're just like, yeah, throw in an emotional scene at the end of this. Sh throw in a, a romantic gesture. This will make everything all right. It just feels really fake in my opinion. Like they clearly try to make all the other stuff that they did look cool. What are we ignoring that now? Did we forget that that just happened? For once, I want one of these movies to just be real with me. I want these movies to be like, Yeah, I'm disgusting. I'm an awful guy. But so what? Deal with it. Th this is who I am. You should really be careful for what you wish for. This is the only movie where they unapologetically try to get you the viewer to join the cult as well. It shows you the horrible actions of these characters and it's just absolutely telling us, look, this right here is epic. Look at how cool the life that these people lead is. In American Pie Beta House, all the characters from the Naked Mile are now in college and they all very desperately want to join Dwight Stifler's frat, the Beta House. In general, this movie is all about making the frat bro lifestyle look as attractive and as great as possible. Women are presented in this movie like just a bunch of dumbasses, really. Not even that, the women in this movie are barely like characters with personality and feelings and emotions. They've just turned all the women in this movie into weird soulless props. They're just an accessory for the frat bros to have to look cool. They absolutely adore getting objectified. It's their favorite pastime. Uh, there's this one scene where all the guys are sitting on a balcony, firing water balloons at girls wearing white t-shirts. You wanna know why? You wanna know why they're doing it? Oh, take a guess. They're doing it strategically so they can see through these shirts. And the women realizing what had just happened to them are actually not angry or outraged or anything of the sort. Nope, the opposite actually. In fact, this woman is smiling. She's filled with glee. She's so 
unbelievably thankful that she got the chance to be treated like this. Thank you so much, Stiflers, for sending me off to my next class looking like this. Thank you so, so much. Making her smile after this happens is a very not subtle way for the movie to tell the audience that, hey, look, this is fine. These guys aren't the bad guys. Women love when this happens to them. They think it's awesome. So people have these doubts, and the way I see it is they kind of put them on a shelf in the back of their head, right? And that shelf gets heavier and heavier. And hopefully at one point, the shelf gets heavy enough that it breaks. And at that moment, they'll realize that something's wrong. American Pie Presents Bandcamp is an award-winning movie. Not really. About the struggles of breaking free from the ways you were accustomed to. I'll admit, I hated this movie when I first watched it, uh, mainly because I thought that it was crap, but now I, I see it for the masterpiece that it is. Like we said, this movie stars Steve Stifler's younger brother, Matt, a teenager who, since he was a kid, grew up in his older brother's shadow. Thing I've ever seen. When Matt is old enough to have his own American Pie Presents movie, the first one actually, we can see that this need of him to have his brother's approval has become a defining feature in his life. His brother is now off living his life as an adult film director, and he barely answers any of the letters that his brother sends him. When Matt Stifler is sent to Bandcamp and gets wind of the rumors of what happens over there, he immediately gets right on his Stifler shit, buying a bunch of hidden spy cameras to, to capture all the nasty stuff that he thinks is going on over there, uh, placing some of them in the girls' showers, uh, essentially mimicking what he learned from his brother early on. To get to know the people that go to the camp a bit better, he decides to do the usual American Pie thing and pretends that he has emotions and that he's sensitive just like them. Which as usual, as we've learned, eventually leads to him actually developing those emotions and, you know, dealing with that. Matt Stifler's way of life that he learned from his brother is constantly under attack in this film. Everyone's criticizing him all the time, saying that he shouldn't be this awful of a human being, and he just doesn't get it. This is the stuff that he learned was right since he was a kid. So how could any of this possibly be bad? He even recounts at one point a moment where he was supposed to perform a show in front of the whole school, and realizing that Stifler and his friends are gonna be showing up in there, he decided to drop the whole thing in the fear of embarrassing himself in front of his brother. Eventually, Matt decides to consult Jim's father about the whole thing, who's like a camp counselor in this movie for some reason. He tells him about his brother, Steve, that... Yeah, you're like your brother, Steve. And I don't think those are the shoes you should be so eager to fill. Looking at Matt's expression at this point, you can tell that he's not really surprised anymore by this notion. Trying to be the new Stiffmeister, has brought only pain and misery onto his life. Jim's dad even tells him that the people Steve considered his friends really didn't like him very much. What? This moment releases Matt from his shackles. He realizes that this guy, his leader, is a complete moron. Like Dr. Yanya said, all the doubts that have stacked up on the shelf in the back of his mind have become heavier and heavier until the shelf eventually collapsed. Matt breaks free. He decides to delete all the creep shit that he filmed during the summer, and he even does a big grand romantic gesture to his love interest in this movie. And they live happily ever after. Stifler leaves the cult. But I think this begs the question, does this one act of goodness actually redeem Matt Stifler from all the awful things that he did? Like all the actual criminal acts that he committed? <laughs> Ah, uh, well, it sure seems like the movie treats it that way. Yeah, I kind of decided to skip over American Pie, uh, Book of Love, and American Reunion, just because I really didn't have that much to say about them. American Pie, Book of Love is just a rehash of the original movie's plot. C can we not come up with original stories anymore? It's really not that bad of a movie, but I've, I've already watched... 10 hours of American Pie movies up until that point. This was my seventh one, so I, I can't really care all that much about these characters and what they're going through. American Reunion brings back the original cast for a, a, a reunion, 
and it tends to be a pretty fun movie. I feel like if you watch the original one and liked it, you're probably gonna like this one too. One of my main grips with this movie, like I said, is that they just pushed the reset button on Stifler and just returned him into being this kind of annoying teenager again. But now he's in his late 30s. You got a lot of work to do. <laughs> God, I hope he dies. This isn't even a joke at this point. This is a plea for help. Screw this movie and screw Stifler. One of the main lessons that our characters learn in this movie is that they all should just accept Stifler the way that he is. And... Wow. You, you gotta be like an actual moron if you think that that's a good sentiment to pass on. Really? You think that he should just stay the same? Really? Jesus Christ. But now, with American Pie number a billion, they decided, hey, it's a new decade. A, a new American Pie must come. Let's change things up a little, go crazy. Maybe have a, a, an old female cast? Ha, <laughs> look at us. We're up with the times. Women are in movies now. If we're sticking to the cult analogies from earlier, I'd say that this movie it is essentially the equivalent of the cult leader putting on a mustache and just pretending that he's a different guy <laughs> when when he realizes how much trouble he might be in if he does the same stuff right now. I don't like bullies and I don't like massaging a sick douchebag disrespecting me in my own house. I don't like you! Obviously, this isn't a statement I'm ever gonna disagree with. I also believe that misogynistic douchebags are in fact bad. I don't really like them, but you do. American Pie movies, you do. Y you can't lie to me. I know that you do. You absolutely love them. That's why you have a stand-in actor play your biggest misogynistic douchebag in every single movie that you make. Are you trying to trick me right now? Do you think I'm an idiot? They keep repeating statements like that over and over and over again. All this coming straight from, from the Stifler's mouth. Just don't throw up anywhere or do any non-consensual groping. That's your job for today. It's almost comedic to an extent. It's like that skit with the hot dog man. Oh man, oh oh geez, I really hope we find this Stifler character that's been causing so much trouble and misogyny over the years. Wow, uh, that character is really some piece of work. It's not really like American Pie couldn't have changed in the past few years or so. It's more just the fact that this feels kind of disingenuous. It feels disingenuous to have a character repeat all the time how they're against misogyny, while being the franchise that peddled those same ideas again and again and again throughout the years and used them for their advantage. You know who was one of the writers from this? David H. Steinberg. Remember, I told you to, to remember his name earlier. He was also working on that lesbian scene from earlier. So it is literally the same guy. The same guy who wrote this, the stupid scene where he says that he found a lesbian artifact, and this movie. So, ha. Huh. You didn't predict that there would be a really cool and smart and handsome guy that is also funny on the internet that would be watching all these films right after another and will have all these things that you did in the past fresh in his memory. All in all, this movie isn't that bad. I thought I got a bit too much flack online. I'd personally give it like a, I don't know, a five out of 10. Or maybe a four because it, it repeats once again the plot of the movie, the, the original one. It was pretty fascinating to go back and watch these movies, this time noticing the pretty dangerous themes that they tend to push forward. It's pretty obvious that during these movies' peak of popularity, a lot more teenagers would be invested in this rather than a sex adolescent in school. And doing that, grabbing the attention of a developing mind, has a certain power that you can't really ignore. And I think the main question we should be asking ourselves right now is, what happens when that teenage boy who grew up idolizing Stifler, any of the Stiflers, and saw them forcing themselves upon women, using them for their own pleasures, grows up and becomes an adult? Because that's like now. That's, that's the time that we're living in right now. That's, that's this moment. Kind of worrying, in my opinion. Hope you liked this video. If you reached the end of this, make sure to sneak in the word pie into your comment. Uh, just as a little treat. This took me ages and ages and ages to make. Part of it was just the fact that I got COVID while doing it. It definitely slowed things down a bit. But hey, it seemed like you guys enjoyed this sort of longer form of video with the last one I made. 
which is nice. That that took lots of time too, and I was pretty proud of it. I won't lie, uh, making these bigger sort of videos that in turn cause me to upload a bit less because they take more time has caused a bit of a financial toll. Um, so if you want to support the channel on Patreon, that would obviously be great. Uh, but don't feel obligated to do that. It's only if you actually want to and can actually afford doing that. If not, don't worry about it. That the videos are still going to be free. I really find it fulfilling making these type of bigger videos. I enjoy it a lot more. So yeah, any sort of way that I can keep on managing to do that as a job would be pretty sick in my eyes. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at Pinely with two Ys and on Instagram at PinelyBox if you want to see the post of me uh, changing the color of my hair for the first time. It was a big day for me. Next video is going to be about something I actually really like. Uh, has to do with time loops. And besides that, goodbye.